guys, and welcome to Manch Talk. I'm Carla Garrick. And I'm Mark Warden. Mark is here to join us. As you guys can see, Tammy is not with us this week. She has the fun task of moving her home to the lake, which is not the worst of things, but she is working on that. And so I invited Mark to come chat about a lot of things that actually pertain to most people in Manchester. First of all, we're both running for office, so we'll be talking about that a little bit. Maybe just delve into, I don't know, whatever's in current politics. And then Mark and I are going to talk a little bit about the housing market here in New Hampshire. I'm sure many of you are curious about what's going on. There seems to be a shortage, what's been happening up at the State House, and what maybe would be the landscape looking towards 2025. So thank you for joining us. Yes, and Mark, thank you for joining me. Tell folks back home who maybe don't know who you are, uh, just briefly who you are. Okay, thanks, Carl. <laughs> it's, it's great to be here. Um, I live in Manchester and have been involved in both real estate and politics for quite some time. I've been a real estate broker for over 20 years, um, focusing on residential real estate and relocations in southern New Hampshire. Nice. And politically, I've been elected four times to the state house. Twice. <laughs> That's from, four times better than me. <laughs> twice in, in Goffstown, and then more recently in Manchester's Ward Eight. Okay. I was elected in 2018, 2020. Okay, so for the normal people out there who aren't geeks and politicos like us, where is Ward Eight? Ward Eight less? generally is the southernmost ward in the city. It's down uh, South Willow and down towards the airport and South Mammoth Road around Memorial High School. Okay, nice. Yeah. And that big uh, post office where I often have to go mail yeah, things I'm, I'm last, last minute. Um, and of course, I'm running in Manchester as well. I'm in the Floterial this time, which is kind of like a weird district, right? I was trying to remember all my wards. So I'm in Ward 1, mm -hmm. which is on the north end. And then three and four, which is downtown, that used to be part of my Senate district. Uh, that's a tough area just because it has high turnover. Yeah. It's hard to knock doors because it, people are in apartments and no one really wants to hear from you. Um, and then of course, Ward 10 and 11 and 12, which is new, 12 is new for me too. And those are all West Side, and mm -hmm. 10 and 11 at least. And so, it's, you know, it's kind of interesting. Big district. It's huge. I it's, mean, it's it's the size of a Senate district. Yeah. I may as well just have done that. I mean, you know, well, I, if, we, you're, if you do direct mail into a district like that, it can be very expensive as well. So it's, it's harder to run those campaigns. I'm also running a floaterial. For those people who don't know what it is, floaterial was a term of art they used in the legislature when redistricting, I believe in 2011. And it's kind of like an at large district. Right. So I'm actually, even though I live in Ward 8 and previously elected just for Ward 8, this year, I'm running in a floaterial, some of yours, that covers wards six, eight, and nine. Okay. It's a three ward district. And how many people on the ticket there? Is it just you it, and another Republican on your that's side? That's right. It's, it's two seats. Each ward has two uh, elected officials. Right. Then some of the floaterials have two or three. Right. We actually one. have four because ours is so crazy and so big. But um, so what do you feel like? What's the vibe out there? Have you been door knocking? Like, yeah, what have you I, been I out have to? I've actually been talking to voters door to door. <laughs> nice. the, last week when we went out with a, a big splash, had a lot of our candidates co covering multiple wards. Nice. And we were pretty well received. First of all, people were nice at the door. Most people aren't even home, or if they see us coming, sometimes they don't answer the door. But those we engaged with were generally friendly and um, not that engaged, really, in, in the political scene yet. That was my takeaway. Right. A lot of people hear about the national race. Yep. So they ask you about uh, Harris and, and Trump, and I just try to say, hey, we're, I'm running for the state legislature. Let's right. focus on keeping New Hampshire awesome. Yep. Let's do the best we can for the state, keep property taxes in check, uh, keep the state budget from going out of control on its spending, and, and really address some of these local concerns. And people seem to uh, react well to that. Right. But then when you ask them what their major concerns are, they may talk about something like, oh, the pothole out front, you know, which isn't really a state issue, it's right. a more of a city issue. Yeah, so that is kind of interesting, right? Because national politics kind of drives who comes out to vote. And you'll hear terms like vote down the ticket. So if you are at home and you are supporting the Republicans, vote down the ticket. What do I mean by that? So the first time I ran in 2016, I had no idea what that meant. But basically, the delta between the number of votes I got and the number that uh, Governor Sununu got was 40%, meaning mm -hmm. had 
everyone who had voted for Governor Sununu voted for me, I probably would have gotten in, right? And so that's very interesting that people kind of drop off the further down they get. And that's why name recognition is vitally important. Mm -hmm. So the signs, I think on Facebook, folks can see Mark's sign down mm -hmm. uh, under the table. But, um, but you know, what I'm kind of hearing a lot of as well is the economy, right? That's right. Like it's the economy, stupid. And that is a little bit within our control, not inflation, not groceries, but that kind of stuff. But being able to keep property taxes low, as you said, mm -hmm. trying to keep the budget in check in New Hampshire. And uh, we were both at a function on Monday, and I thought it was interesting. They were talking about these sort of budgetary big ticket items that are kind of looming right here sure. in New Hampshire. There's the DCYF. Mm -hmm. lawsuits from the, the uh, juvenile center over here that looks like it's going to cost billions of dollars and just, you know, stuff that we are going to have to grapple with. So I think it's important for voters to know they should have people in who understand economics, understand what drives economies, and that is business people like you and, and like me. So... And also we're seeing in drastic increases in people's insurance, homeowners insurance, car insurance. A lot of the, the voters are feeling the pinch there. Obviously in groceries, inflation has really kicked in the last few years. So can we address things like that at the state level? Um, in some cases, yes, indirectly. Mainly by freeing up competition, right. allowing more competition, more competitors, more businesses out there to, um, to compete and provide goods and services. Typically, in general, that uh, leads to lower prices and better service levels. So, you know, we'll try to do that, try to avoid some of the monopoly, you know, oligopoly type uh, businesses. Right. And and also just competition. I think we, we've lost sight of the fact that competition by its very nature actually means you are excelling towards a higher level, right? So if, if done right. So when, when there's a unbalance between, say, the big corporations and the little guy, you know, we can talk. But the idea is if we allow people to compete and allow a freer market to work, you're actually allowing more people to do what they love, mm -hmm. to um, figure that out, and to go chase it, right? Like I have a friend who loves um, baking bread, right? And then another one likes baking bread and she's gluten free, right? And that's what the market is, right? So you can actually eventually be like, oh, I need the gluten free bread. Maybe you like the, <laughs> the delicious bread. Uh, the good um, stuff. Yeah, you know, and so regulatory stuff has made it even hard for those kinds of people just to run a little business. Yeah, that's right. In the last two legislative sessions, there's been a lot of talk about these professional licensure schemes, right? And these are uh, real barriers to entry for people who are just starting out in a new a new type of a new industry or a new type like of job. Me in the real estate. Uh, you're in the real estate. <laughs> Very expensive to be a real estate agent here. To become a plumber or uh, li licensed electrician, you have to get, go through a lot of journeyman time, a lot of expense just to get there. Even s simple things like hair braiding or hairstylist has uh, hundreds of hours of required training just to get a license before you can start serving the people. Because, so, you know, God forbid, someone's braid is a little skewed yeah, or something, heaven right? Forbid. <laughs> so these, all these things make it tougher, particularly for people who don't have a lot of education, if they just want to start out uh, working to get a, a new skill or start a new business, well, they're finding these regulatory burdens or, or obstacles keeping them from that. So we, have, we, as state legislators, actually can work on things like that. And actually there was this year, I believe, a lot of work done on professional licensing. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of states that didn't have reciprocity now have reciprocity Correct. with New Hampshire. So if you're like a masseuse or I don't know, an OT or a manicurist, I don't know what the categories are exactly, uh, but you can probably find that on OPLC.gov, I think mm -hmm. the uh, professional licenses office. But one of the things I learned was they streamlined, they had over 300 forms <laughs> for different okay. licenses in New Hampshire, and they have condensed that into one form, which I was like, go, I mean, if we need red tape, at least make it usable, you know what I mean? And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. So 
for the folks who watch this uh, remotely or on social media who are thinking about moving to New Hampshire because it is frankly, the best place on earth to live, <laughs> then, uh, you know, these are the kinds of considerations. We are trying to make it freer and easier for people who understand the, volu uh, the value proposition of what New Hampshire is. So what New Hampshire is, is in a housing shortage. <laughs> and again, some of this leads back to uh, the regulatory burdens that are put, put in place. So basically, yes, there's been a housing shortage for many years now where the demand for new housing or rental units has outstripped the supply. There's been very relatively little new supply come online in the last decade. Uh, there are a number of reasons for this. It's very expensive. Labor is expensive. The, the materials really shot up after COVID lockdowns and such. So the actual hard cost are, are a formidable challenge for builders and developers. But there are also some things from a regulatory standpoint that uh, could be done to ease the situation, make it just a little bit easier for builders to build. Yeah, you know, I was fascinated. I was at a meeting last week with someone who uh, came to talk. I mean, it was primarily to a group of Republicans, and the conversation started very much with an acknowledgement that you know, inflation is out of control. Yeah. That 30% that we can just all see that is pretty much across the board. It's in rents, it's in your food, it's in your groceries, it's in the cost of your energy, your petrol, all of it, right? Your gas, you Americans. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, so he was lamenting, inflation, inflation, inflation has made this hard. But then towards the end of the conversation, he was talking about how we need more federal grants to do more affordable housing and um, workforce housing. And, you know, luckily I had actually another meeting to go to because I was going to be like, ah, 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 I have some opinions about this. But, uh, but, you know, he didn't seem to see the irony, which is for folks back home, the reason we have the inflation is because federal grants sounds like free money, but it's coming from somewhere and it's coming from the money they print. And the more they print, the more expensive everything becomes is the short version. So sure, we have, we have a shortage, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, being problem solvers, we're like, okay, what can we do about it? So I know in this past legislative session, we have seen an appetite more so uh, for changes because, you know, how government works. It's like we're going to kick the can until it's a crisis and then we're just going to do something, right? My, my take was let's just do a zoning moratorium for 10 years, mm -hmm. just 10 years, and then we see what happens, right? Because they... They're so incremental, but right. on the incremental scale, there were a few bills that came out. Um, do you want to kind of talk over them a little bit? Yeah, let's talk about some things like ADUs. That yep. was one that came out a few years ago with support from the Association of Realtors, their lobbyist group, and I'm a realtor and I was in legislature at the time. ADU stands for Accessory Dwelling Unit. Some people call it a granny flat or yeah. in-law suite or a college student apartment. So you're talking about finishing out your basement, for example, putting a bathroom and kitchen down there. But in this case, it was really to promote the idea that people could construct an additional living unit, an uh, accessory dwelling unit on their house, either attached or detached. Nice. Uh, it's, it's maybe to have either a renter there or just keep someone in your family, an extended generation living with you without having to you know, be kicked out of the house or something. And it seemed like a, a good idea. And what we found in working on the legislation is a lot of towns were prohibiting this. Mm -hmm. They just didn't like an, any more, they would call it more like multiple housing. So even though it's a single family house zone, they weren't allowing for these ADUs. So the state had to come in and uh, say, okay, towns, you may not restrict ADUs. You have to allow it ADUs. Now you can put some regulations on them in regards to uh, setbacks and sewage and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. but you have to allow it in, in single family zoning. And I think that was a net positive. It did allow a lot of families to keep an aging parent or a college student in their home without uh, ne then requiring another house somewhere else to be built. Right. And also, you know, we talk a lot on the Manch Talk here with uh, Tammy specifically about the homeless crisis uh -huh. here in Manchester, right? And 
people don't seem to put together these ideas that if you let the market be freer, i.e. you let people come up with solutions, you know, maybe, maybe, I mean, this won't sound appealing to everyone, but it's like maybe someone has an electrified she shed or a, or a tiny home <laughs> that's just pulled in their backyard, right? And who knows, like uh, certainly in South Africa, when I was growing up with the informal economy, you know, people would allow someone to say, stay on their property in return for doing the gardening for a month or, you know, whatever. So you're trading a lodging, which someone needs because no one wants anyone to be sleeping on the sidewalk. You know, that's just not the way we should do things. Um, but because we've made housing expensive, because it's so regulatorily controlled, and you know, we we create these barriers that then create these other problems that right. then become these knock-on problems that t 30 years later, people are like, oh, why did that happen? And I'm like, we told you 30 years yeah, ago. Yeah, incremental is the right <laughs> way. And that's, we've seen that with this so-called NIMBY factor, right. NIMBY not in my backyard. You don't see it as much in Manchester because we have relatively small lots. It's a city, city-sized residential lots. But in the surrounding towns, they have a lot of restrictions in there in regards to minimum lot size, minimum setbacks, rear, side, and front that limit new construction or, or raise the price of it. And basically, they, they claim they don't want a lot of new apartment buildings or a lot of new kids in the school. But the fact is the school enrollments have been declining for years and years and years. So that's, that's not really a worry. They just don't want the extra traffic. And people love the pristine look of their quaint little town and houses spread way out. But, you know, that's not going to help solve the, the housing shortage. So right. something's got to be done. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I actually still think that land is pretty cheap in New Hampshire as compared to some other places. And, and there are areas that actually don't even have zoning. Yeah, There's right. that nhzoningatlas.org that people can look at to really look on a granular level, like what is the zoning at this particular address, which is always interesting because I've been with the real estate stuff. I'm going to places where, first of all, I'm like, I mean, I thought I had gone all over New Hampshire in the almost 20 years I've been here, right. but I have not. I am discovering new and incredibly beautiful places stark new hampshire so pretty yeah, it's pretty up there like a lot big covered bridge um i forget how we got there but anyway so <laughs> well um, another thing we want to talk about for uh regards to zoning and legislative changes there was one just coursing through the legislature this year that had to do with uh, cities allow and this was actually a true bi bipartisan bill that was going to force towns to allow a duplex on a single family lot if, it, if there was city water and sewer there. Oh, wow. So that's very appropriate to a city like Manchester where we have those, you know, city and uh, water and sewer almost everywhere. If there's if it's a single family lot that they'd have to allow by right a duplex. And there was a lot of good debate and it ultimately it failed. Oh, did Again, it? part of this NIMI factor. People just I know there's a housing shortage but they're afraid to actually make those changes. So I, I know there were a couple of other ones that had passed in the last couple of years. The one was the Homnibus bill, like <laughs> Homnibus, like Omnibus, right? That was HB 1400. And that was to convert the commercial spaces that yeah. aren't currently being used into possibly doing housing. And so one of the outcomes from COVID, of course, with this work at home or the hybrid jobs that we're now seeing, which, you know, no one loves a two hour commute. So I'm kind of pro allowing people to, to you know, figure out what works for them. But um, a lot of the commercial market is now suppressed, right? Like Particularly the, office. Yeah. yeah. And so this omnibus bill, omnibus bill mm. is attempting to allow developers, I guess, to convert some of these spaces. So my understanding is actually Brady Sullivan is converting some of the buildings in Manchester mm -hmm. in the downtown area into apartments from 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 buildings. Uh, yeah, yeah we see that over the years. They did a nice job with the uh, Citizens Bank building right here on Elm yep. Street, converting a lot of those to condos. And to Manchester's credit, the city uh, building department, building zoning department here, from what I understand from developers, has been very uh, proactive, very 
uh, helpful in, right. in allowing these variances and pushing these variances and pushing development. So kudos to them, and let's hope it continues. That, that's great. And actually, there is over a thousand units coming online in Manchester. So if you don't live here you you know, yet and you want to. Uh, talk to us uh, at some stage because, you know, maybe you do a landing spot, a rental for the first year, uh, and then figure out that perfect house, or maybe we sell you your perfect house right out the gate. Um, One of the things I don't want to see, though, is these, um, like, tax abatements and subsidies, because really that's a slap in the face to those people who, in recent past, took the risk and spent the money to build and be developers, and now this new class comes along and they get all of a, all of a sudden an abatement that these people didn't? I mean, that's really not fair. So uh, we don't, uh, the government, in many ways the government causes a problem. Let's not ask them to pr pr provide a solution because they're going to mess it up. Right, and, and honestly, I was trying to think this morning early. I was playing with my AI and I thought, um, I was asking it to like write a commercial or something. And yeah, the whole issue of, government making things worse is it's just <laughs> it's just baked into it you know the less regulations we have the better because then people have again the freedom as individuals to do what they think is best government hardly ever comes up with the best solution. No. The government is one size fits all, right? It's, it's a hammer, so everything looks like a nail. Right, <laughs> exactly. Um, so this one was kind of interesting. I had heard about this, the Pro Real Property Transfer on Death Act. That went through, that was HB 68. And I believe that just simply says, if you have two names on a deed, or if you have more than one name on a deed, I suppose, then you can just have it transferred to that person without having to go through probate. So that just saves a little bit of money, a little bit of hassle, and a little bit of paperwork. Yeah, there, that was already in place for th joint tenancy, if that was the situation, how your deed, uh, how your property was held, the vesting on the deed. But this is for other situations. So yeah, I think it's going to be a net positive. Cool. And then the last one I have here, which I don't really know much about, has to do with manufactured housing. And that was HB 1361 that talks about municipalities having to allow reasonable expansions of uh, existing parks. So that is probably just also something, obviously manufactured homes or mobile parks are trying to cater for maybe the lower income, lower middle class, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, renter, buyer, that kind of thing. And so there's a need, right? Like not everyone can afford a Mac mansion. And so if you have a healthy, robust market by allowing everyone the freedom to do what they want, you actually end up catering for everyone because different people are trying to genuinely fulfill different people's needs. Now let's hope the viewers out here watching today and in the future can uh, support this cause. If you truly believe that we need more housing, and we say we, let's not ask the government to fix it, but feel free to call your state representative, your alderman. Uh, your Elect zone, us so uh, we could go do the right job. Uh, to, <laughs> just to encourage them to support more options, more opportunities, uh, less regulation, less um, less uh, blockage to people being developers. That's what we need. And then the other thing I thought was kind of cool is uh, this decentralized autonomous organizations, DAO. So yeah. the way of the DAO, how with the way of the DAO. This actually also passed, and I believe Sununu signed it. It was HB 1503 uh, that passed last yes. year. And this one uh, is like, Kind of like an LLC, but for crypto? It has, it's related to cryptocurrencies and to the blockchain. Okay, there are a lot of, and this DAO, as you pointed out, what it stands for is really, it's an entity, and it's, it's new, because it sits on the blockchain, and the DAO typically is, sits on, uses Ethereum network, and it has something called smart contracts. So these are, um, actions that can be executed automatically in this automated uh, way. And it's basically like, if this, then. So you're basically writing a contract that has it automated. So when, you know, all the signatures have come in on this thing, then this next yeah. triggering event happens. And so a lot of what one would do with a contract becomes uh, automatic, That's therefore right. cheaper, right? 
And, um, and the thing is, in, there was no legal framework for this because it's, it's a new concept. So the, the, the people uh, in the legislature uh, wisely spoke with the banking department, the Secretary of State, Keith Ammon, who's a state rep out of New Boston, and, and Mont Vernon uh, headed up a committee. And they, they saw this was a little piece that could be improved in our state legislature to invite more innovation with this. And basically what this law allowed is for a DAO to be considered a legal entity for purposes of the Secretary of State, similar, to, let's say, to an LLC. And now this, uh, this other type of entity is included in that, that law. So very cutting edge stuff yeah. happening here in the free state of New Hampshire because <laughs> we like to keep New Hampshire awesome, as I like to say. I still laugh because that was Drew Klein when he was still at the union leader. He was like, you should just make a bumper sticker that says, keep New Hampshire awesome. And I was like, yes, I will. So I have one of those. If anyone's watching this and you want one of those, Email me at manchtalk at gmail. I was wondering where those came from. I see them all over the city. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I made I'm them because, Oh, you do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I made them because I was being interviewed by Drew once, and I was talking, you know, up New Hampshire because I love it so much. And he was like, my son would love a Keep New Hampshire Awesome bumper sticker. So I just made them as a lark, but then I made a lot, so I have some extras. <laughs> Um, all right, so any last thoughts that half an hour always goes so quickly. I do want to remind people we do have a crypto conference coming up this weekend. Mark Warden and myself will be speaking together with uh, some other crypto luminaries, people who understand the free state really well, people who understand what the value proposition here in New Hampshire is. You can still get free tickets if you go to um, the Eventbrite page or start at Chainstone. Uh, com, and then you will follow the leads to get uh, to the Eventbrite page. It's a long URL. I don't remember it off the top of my head. Um, that is the FSBDAC conference. That stands for Free State Blockchain Digital Asset Conference, mm -hmm. now in its eighth year. So check that out. You'll be there on Sunday. Looking forward to it. We'll be talking a little bit more in depth about some of the stuff we covered here today. Since you are running for office, tell folks back home how to get a hold of you. Uh, that's great, Carla. I appreciate that. The easiest way is through my website, which is markwarden.com. I have some of the, the policy issues there and a little bit of history about uh, my legislative experience. And if you're in Ward 6, 8, or 9 in Manchester, I'd appreciate your vote. The primary state primary is coming up on September 10th, and then the general is on November 5th. That is correct, and people can find me at CarlaGarrick.com. That is G-E-R-I-C-K-E, -E, Carla with a C. And if you have any feedback, feel free to message us at manchtalk at gmail.com. We will be back here again next week, hopefully with Miss Tammy. And in the meantime, I hope everyone has an incredible week. And remember, not only live free or die, but live free and thrive. Thanks, guys.